Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, so my talk is going to be slightly different than the talks you typically see here at Brucon because indeed I'm going to talk about privacy. I want to debunk some, some misconceptions there and not just talk about privacy, I'm going to talk about ice cream too. Not beer like yesterday, but I like ice cream more, yeah. Um, bear with me, I'm not just going to talk about ice cream. In the next couple of minutes, I will talk about ice cream, but also share some key takeaways already. So, ice cream. Remember when you were a kid and your parents took you to the ice cream shop? Or maybe now your parent yourself, you take your kid there. What does a kid say when they enter the ice cream shop and see all those bright looking colors? They go like, oh my god, I want a scoop of each, right? We're older now, we're wiser. We know, probably not the best idea. So, what do parents say? Well, they say, I don't think so. Like, have one or two scoops, that's all you really need. Don't have more, otherwise it will get messy. And that's already key takeaway one. A great advice for ice cream, and even better advice for privacy. When you're dealing with personal information, that's the thing you should take into account. Do I really need this data? When I collect it, when I process it, when I store it, when I share it, make that reflection. If you don't need it, then don't store it, don't collect it, don't process it, because otherwise it can get messy. The more data, the more responsibilities, and big data means big problems. Okay, let me keep rolling with this ice cream um, example for just a tiny bit longer. I like to dig into what goes on in the parents' minds. In those couple of seconds between the kid going, I want a scoop of each, and you reach the counter and you say, well, just two scoops, that's enough. What I think happens is the kid says, I want a scoop of each, and as a parent, you make this mental image. You, you try to visualize it. You see that cone with lots of scoops on top. And because you can visualize it, it's easy to start thinking about all the stuff that can go wrong. Cone, lots of scoops, that means one is bound to fall off, make a mess. It's just too much to finish, that's a shame. The kid, we all know the kid that starts eating from the bottom of the cone. We don't want that. The neon pink or blue color, they don't like that. You end up eating it, you don't like it either. And while it's ice cream, it's bound to melt and make a mess. Okay, we know all this stuff, we want to avoid it, so that's why we start thinking about what are we going to do about it. So, we tell the kid, just two scoops, that's more than enough, and stick to your favorite flavor, that neon pink one. You don't like it, salted caramel, we know you do. And no cone, get it in a cup. Almost at the counter, you have this split second to reflect because actually, today we had kind of a big lunch, so probably two scoops will be too much. Let's just, one scoop might be enough. And well, yes, the kid likes salted caramel, but we're at a different shop where the kid thinks the salted caramel tastes too salty and too caramelly. For those thinking, I'm stretching the example. You need to meet my kid. Um, and yes, it's in a cup, but let's get lots of napkins just to be on the safe side. Okay, crisis averted, we can order and enjoy the ice cream. These four simple questions, simple steps, that's something we do all the time. When we order ice cream, when we leave the house and check whether we lock the door, when we drive here and take into account the traffic so we, we leave a bit earlier, we do it all the time, it's not rocket science. This thing is actually also called threat modeling. For security, for privacy, doing that intentionally in a structured way, that has so much value. So that's key takeaway two. Asking yourself these questions, doing that intentionally in a structured way, will help you early on already think about the security and privacy problems in your system and implement those accordingly. Okay, so. Who am I? Why I'm talking about ice cream? Well, I love ice cream. Um, I'm a privacy engineer. I actually started my career a long time ago as a security researcher at a university. 
in a project, started working on privacy, realized this stuff is really cool, it's much more fun and interesting than security. I still like you guys, it's fine. Um, and I, I basically combined what I knew as a security researcher working on AppSec, secure design, threat modeling, combined with privacy that resulted in the Linux privacy threat modeling framework, and, and I kept going from there. Currently, I am a cyber and privacy manager at BWC here in Belgium, and I love that combination of working on security, working on privacy, and especially on that combination, because as you will see later, both really strengthen each other. I work in this really cool team with cyber privacy and resilience experts. Um, just want to say how awesome we are. Um, <laughs> there's a couple here, as you can hear. I love to talk about all these things, so feel free to reach out to me after if you have any questions. Enough about me, let's talk about privacy. Um, usually, when I tell people I work on privacy, I get a, either an eye roll or a sigh, followed by the question, but why? Well, because privacy matters. And then people say, yeah, yeah, fine, fine, but not for me, because I do nothing wrong. I have nothing to hide. And it's great. Kudos on you for not becoming a criminal. Great. But that doesn't mean you don't have anything to hide. We all have things that we don't want just anybody to know. It would be really uncomfortable if somebody would be peeping through the blinds of your house, looking into the kitchen, the bedroom, the bathroom, all those things. Imagine yesterday evening at a party, some random stranger would come up to you and start asking questions. Like, OK, you look like a person who goes running or riding a bike. How often do you do that? Where do you go? Where do you live, by the way? Do you have lots of valuables in your house? It's, is it expensive? Do you have kids? How is the relationship going? Are you planning to have more kids anytime soon? Yeah, cringy. Um, but then if we think about what we do in the online world, in the digital world, we have all these cool applications, devices, um, appliances, and we are kind of sharing that information. And that's fine because it makes our lives so much easier, but we should be aware of the privacy consequences and ideally fix those. So just a couple of examples. We tend to like to share our runs and our bike rides on apps like Strava. And those applications actually have some privacy settings. You can set a privacy perimeter um, to hide your exact starting point or end point, so that means that nobody can actually see where your house or your work address is. Great, in theory, because re researchers have shown that just three of those registrations are sufficient to still pinpoint the precise location. Our house, we have all these cool appliances that make our lives easier, like robot vacuum cleaners. Last year, there was this news item showing that Roomba, so that robot vacuum cleaner, had um, collected a lot of pictures from a, a number of beta testers, and those pictures were annotated with everything in the house. Cabinets, countertops, lights, TVs, things that people own, kits. There was even a picture of a person on a toilet. How do we know that? Because the people who were doing the tagging thought, wouldn't it be fun if we share these images on social media? <laughs> Similar story for Tesla. Tesla employees thought it might be fun to look at car cameras of their customers and share scenes of intimacies. And, well, basically, we're collecting all those data through phones, smartwatches, all those things. And that data, so much data, means you can deduce, you can infer a lot of additional information. Based on your smartwatch, it might be possible to predict pregnancy. So we still have some work to do. OK, OK, talking about privacy, so you're actually talking about compliance, right? We let our lawyers deal with it. Yeah. I think compliance is overrated. I mean, don't get me wrong, we need that stuff, we need legislations, 
GDPR was awesome for me as a privacy engineer because organizations finally uh, had to invest in this. But the thing of going for compliance is that that's indeed typically considered a mostly legal thing. You have your lawyer do a lot of analysis, um, write big documents. We need that stuff because those legal analysis things are also really important. Yet, what is the goal of privacy legislation? What are we all aiming for? That is to have features, systems, products that are privacy respecting, that are secure. Lawyers are great, but they can't do that. We need to engineer those features, those products, those systems with privacy and security in mind. That means we need to have privacy engineering, just like we have security engineering. And that brings me into that security versus privacy conversation. I've had a lot of security people saying, yeah, privacy, sure, don't worry. We do confidentiality. We have access control, we have encryption. We've got your back. And that's great because, yes, that's very important. We need that, we need to protect the data. However, privacy engineering, privacy goes beyond that. Just like security has that CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, availability, privacy engineering also has a triad of protection goals. And that's unlinkability, intervenability, and transparency. Or if you prefer the NIST terminology, because in the US it needs to have different terminology, apparently, that's disassociability, manageability, and predictability. Now, I, uh, I'm going to run you through a couple of examples just to give you a feeling of what these, uh, these goals actually mean. So, unlinkability. Unlinkability, or actually linking, means you're going to connect the dots. You're going to put bits and pieces of information together. Just like playing the game Guess Who. You start from this broad set of profiles of people, and you start asking questions. Is the person a man? Does the person have dark hair? Does the person wear glasses? Each of those pieces of information on their own, they don't reveal much. Yet when you combine them, when you link them, you soon reduce that set of, of potential subjects, and that leads to identification. Now, Unlinkability, linking, is more than just going to that identification part. It's really about tying data together and thereby inferring additional information. Lots of examples there. This is kind of an oldie. A couple of years ago, some researchers in, uh, in Germany showed that when you have fine-grained smart meter readings, you can even deduce what people are watching on TV based on the uh, light display patterns. So, I mean, basically, almost everything can be deduced if you have sufficient data. Completely different example, menstruation. Femtech is a very big business, growing business. There's a number of period tracking apps out there. You might say, what's the big deal? It's this recurring, normal, natural cycle. What's the privacy deal here? Well, two years ago, there was this, this thing going on here in, in the femtech world, because in the US, Roe versus Wade was overturned. So for those not familiar, because Roe versus Wade was overturned, that means that in certain US states, it became illegal to have an abortion. So that scared people because they said, well, if we can get sued for having an abortion, they might use these, these data from these um, period tracking apps as proof. So that triggered a whole update of all these applications, made it possible to have anonymous uh, accounts now. So this shows that you really need to be aware of the broader context of what your application, of what your feature is doing, because there might be a broader impact that you don't think about up front. OK, next one, transparency, intervenability. I like to cover them together because they're they have this interplay going on. Transparency means informing the individual, 
intervenability means giving the individual control, empowering them. And I think the typical example there is something like this. What do you do when you see this kind of pop-up banner, whatever? I just click on the big green button and get on with my life. I mean, we don't have time to read that stuff. And that's exactly the goal of these dark patterns, deceptive patterns. They are designed to make you not read the small print. For all you know, you're selling your soul without realizing. So that's a lack of transparency. In addition, there is this lack of intervenability. You're being nudged to go for the big green button, the less privacy-friendly option. There might be an alternative there, but it's not a fine-grained cho choice. It's like, go for it or don't. Maybe you're okay with sharing a bit of information, not everything. Actually, there was this, uh, this thing, I don't know if you saw it in the news two weeks ago, the Belgium DPA, Data Protection Authority, imposed a daily fine on Media Has, uh, which is kind of a parent company for a couple of local news sites, uh, 25,000 euros a day if they haven't fixed their dark patterns in 40 days. So I took some screenshots from the official decision of the DPA. So one of the things, one of the problems was deceptive colors for buttons. So this is, um, it's in Dutch, I'm gonna translate it. Um, so this is a cookie pop-up thing. It has two buttons, a grayed out one saying more information, and a red one getting the attention saying agree and close this window. So having that one pop up and saying just press this one, also being red kind of saying this is gonna revoke it, reject it, is very deceptive. In addition, there is no, no I don't agree button. So you have to click on the more information button to get to the next screen where it's then possible to say I am gonna reject this. So they said, this is, this is a no-go because there's this imbalance between a consent and a reject option. So um, this and a couple of other um, things led to this, this fine. So they have now about a month to fix this. Um, something else that popped up in my LinkedIn feed the last couple of days, a lot of American people saying, what's going on with LinkedIn? Um, apparently, now they're going to use my information to um, train gener generative AI models and create content based on my content. And they never asked me, they just by default said, yes, go for it. So being the privacy geek that I am, I immediately went to my settings and I saw that I don't have that setting. So now more information arose. Apparently, they only do that for everybody not li living in the EU and not living in the UK. We can assume that they are not doing it for us, or at least don't give us the option to opt out. Um, so there is definitely a lack of transparency, a lack of control there too. And it's not just LinkedIn, similar story to, um, to Meta in June. Um, Microsoft, I mean, all the big ones had this kind of um, issue with, let's just use everything for AI. Okay. I mentioned all of them separately, but of course, we need to tackle them together. Typically, all three of them get violated, so just one more example to, to discuss all of those. Because do you know what your car can collect about you? This was a study last year by Mozilla, and they, they made a list. So let's have a look. Name, address, phone number, email, date of birth. Fine, I guess, makes sense when you buy a car. Driving habit, driving style, use of accelerator, location history. Okay, might give some, some user um, preferences or whatever, Ex user experience, yes. The list continues. Marital status, race, education, medical information, genetic information, 
audio recordings, pictures, gates, sleep data, sexual activity, religion, and so on and so on and so on. This is just a snippet. So I'm going to let that sink in for a second. Your car, all of this. And, well, I mean, it's not that we can't trust our car companies, right? Um, now, there is a bit of a side note. This study is based on privacy notices. So that means that the cars say that they can do it. We're not entirely sure that they are doing it. Yet there are bits and pieces of information popping up all the time. A couple of days ago, there was this um, patent application saying, let's just listen to driver conversations, parse keywords, and use that for in-vehicle advertisement. Uh, a couple months ago, there was this privacy reporter at the New York Times who had a, a series about what your car can collect about you. Apparently, especially in the US, lots. And they also share it with your insurance company. Um, a couple of weeks, months after she published that study, she published a new report saying, oh my god, they did it to me too. And they claim that I actually signed an agreement. So basically, when she bought a new car, the salesperson kind of slipped a consent form in, in the contract. And without actually giving any informed information there, people were, were bound to sign that. OK, so all this stuff, clearly we don't want. What do we want, and how can we do that? Well, we want to have, we want to mitigate this, we want to have controls. There's lots of things going on in the privacy-enhancing technologies world, pets. Um, it's, it's still an evolving domain, so we see new things popping up daily, weekly. I'm just going to try to give a summary so you have a, a feeling of what can be done already. For unlinkability, so that basically boils down to let's have minimality, minimize as much as we can. And that, that, that means two parts. First of all, talking about personal data, we want to reduce that as much as possible. Well, collect as little as you need, reduce that, separate what you're collecting, separate the uh, uh, identifiable information from the other data that you're going to use in production, um, have data retention policies, may, meaning you only store it for as long as you need, de-identify, have k-anonymity, differential privacy, synthetic data, lots of buzzwords in the privacy um, technologies world. So that's about data, minimizing, reducing what you're collecting storing processing, but also limiting, reducing your processing. Because you might have that data, think about the LinkedIn and the meta example, you might have the data, that doesn't mean you should use it for other purposes. It should be in line, it should be proportionate to the intended purposes. Transparency is about informing the individuals. That's often privacy notices, you know, those legalese things you can click on and nobody reads. For the record, that's not the goal. It should be very understandable. There's, there's this new evolution there in the, in the privacy research domain called TET, Transparency Enhancing Technologies, which are created to extract based on the design, the architecture, or the code of the system, these kind of policies uh, or notices, making them actually up to date. Because we can ask the lawyer to draft something at ideation phase, but then once the system is up and running, it's doing a completely different thing. UI, UX design, well, I talked about dark patterns. That's the stuff you want to avoid. Ideally, if you want to be helping the people, there's also this thing called privacy nudges, informing individuals about if you share this information, be aware that this might be a consequence. So, you can even go beyond that. And then there's intervenability, so control empowering the individuals. For a lot of processing of personal information, there's different legal basis, but often it boils down to getting the user consent, individual consent. So that means, also from a technical perspective, you need to manage that consent. You need to be able to store it, to update it, because the user might revoke it. 
you need to be able to verify it, integration with access control. So there's a lot of technical stuff that are going on too. And then there's data subject rights. We have the probably best known one is DSAR, data subject access request. So as an individual, I have the right to request to each organization that is processing my personal information, give me everything you know. That means that as an organization, you need to be able to actually retrieve that. You need to have good data inventory, you need to have APIs in place to actually extract all that stuff. Same for updating. As a user, as an individual, you can request, this is outdated, please update it to this. And in certain cases, deletion as well. As an individual, you have the right to be forgotten. Not all the time, of course, it needs to be proportionate, but it needs to be possible to remove all your information. Also take into account logins, uh, log files, backups, how are you dealing with that? So lots of technical challenges there too. So we know it's not a synonym for confidentiality. So I tend to get then, okay, but it's privacy, it's completely different, we can't do it, it conflicts. Well, it doesn't have to. And to show you it doesn't have to, let me first show you that it does. And talk about non-repudiation. Non-repudiation is a property that security people love. Log everything, make sure we can prove what a user is doing. Important? Yes. From a privacy perspective, we often don't want this. We want to have plausible deniability. I don't want everybody to be able to prove what I did today, yesterday, or last summer. That's something we want to hide. Now, why is there a snail on the picture? Well, because having that, that threat to plausible deniability basically boils down to two things. First of all, you need to have an evidence of a claim. That can be a log file, but for, from a privacy perspective, that can also be somebody took a picture of me or stored somewhere in a database, something that I said. It, it goes beyond just having those log files. So there needs to be evidence of a claim. There needs to be a trace of an action. And that trace needs to be tied to an individual. There needs to be attribution. Okay, so I'm saying that we have non-repudiation for security, plausible deniability for privacy, clearly co conflicting things. So What's the big deal? Uh, what's the big deal? Well, it sounds like a big deal, a big problem, but it doesn't have to be. We can make it work together. Voting is a, is a good example. In Belgium, for certain elections, we are obliged to vote, so we have to have non-repudiation secure proof that we went voting, we cast the vote. Security property. From a privacy perspective, we want to be able to deny how we voted. We don't want any strong proof about how we voted. Plausible deniability. Now, that's the same action, casting a vote. That can have plausible deniability and non-repudiation at the same time. We make it work on a paper version, we make it work on, on digital voting. What is important here is that we tackle them early on together. If we just say, okay, let's just store name and the way somebody votes, well, then we're not going to fix the, the plausible deniability requirement. But by fixing it early, by finding a way to, to reconcile both, it's perfectly possible to have both together. What is important, though, is that you remember that you require a different mindset. Security is about protecting the company assets. Keep everything we have safe, away from the bad guys. Privacy is, is a different story. Privacy is about the individuals, about the personal data. So looking at it from the perspective of, of the individuals acting in their best interest. So yes, we want to keep the bad guys out, but also we need to do some reflection on the stuff we're doing with the data, checking for internal misbehavior. And even more so than saying it's possible to have both together, it's actually valuable to have both together because they strengthen each other. I talked about security strengthening privacy before. Of course, we need to have confidentiality for privacy. 
We can de-identify as much as we want. If we don't have encryption, if we don't have access control, it's just out there on the streets. But the other side is true too. If we minimize, if we, we reduce the information, then, well, if or when there is a data breach, the impact will be less because there's just less data that can be leaked. In addition to strengthening each other from a conceptual um, view, there is also the, the strengthening from the process view, from the analysis view. Security focuses on assets, on technical details, on attacks. Privacy gives you an additional viewpoint, so that, that gives you some more, well, a different perspective by looking at the more logical, the business flow, focusing on the data, focusing on the users. That means you're also focusing on how you can give value to your users, and that gives value to your overall organization, to your system, and your investors love that too. So having that diverse perspective will help, will strengthen overall the system, the organization. But we already do security. Exactly, you already do security. That's awesome, that's great, because privacy and security share the same foundation. Way back when, I was talking to a security friend of mine, Brooke Schoenfield, he's been in the field a long, long time, he was saying, when I started working on this, security and privacy were there together, because security people, we care about the data, we want to protect the data, that means we also care about individuals, we want to make sure that everything goes well. Um, at some point, that kind of became an all, its own discipline, got absorbed by GRC. It's time to bring it back because we need to have it in engineering. Because we all care about data, we all care about individuals. Because it has that same shared foundation, that means that the engineering processes to fix security, fix privacy, are very, very similar. So we can leverage that, we should leverage that. We should integrate privacy in the security development lifecycle. It's already there, security practices, it works. It's a more mature domain. We don't, we don't want to have privacy somewhere in isolation. We want to actually integrate it, meaning that we're looking for aligning what we need to do for privacy and, and aligning that with what's going on for security. And what I think is a great way to do that in practice is threat modeling. So, we talked about the ice cream example before. Threat modeling means that you're upfront analyzing your system in a structured way. I can talk for hours about this topic. Um, these four questions are actually uh, created by Adam Shostek to highlight what is basically the essence of, of threat modeling. He did a keynote here a couple of years ago, so check out the recording if you want more information on threat modeling in general. So it's, it's about understanding your system, thinking about what can go wrong in a systematic way, fixing it, and there's a reflection step. Just a, a second on the what can go wrong, because I think that's where the main strength is here. If I ask you to look at a system and think about security or think about privacy, how do you do that? How do you actually do that? It, it might be very ad hoc brainstorming-wise, Maybe you're an expert and you just know. Threat modeling means you're going to do that in a more structured, in a systematic way. And there's a bunch of techniques and knowledge bases and mnemonics out there that will help you, that will guide you, that will give you that structure. Like Stride from Microsoft, created 25 years ago for security threat modeling, a pretty well-known approach. I'm very biased. Linden is great too for privacy. Um, it's inspired by Stride, and that actually gives that, that, that alignment value that I was talking about before. We're already doing it for security. The privacy part is actually the same, maybe with a different mindset, but the process is the same, so combining them together makes it more efficient, more effective. And I just want to highlight that it's not just something you do up front. Yes, Threat modeling will help you to systematically think about the problems early on. And you can use it also to structure a DPIA, data protection impact assessment. 
But it goes beyond that. It's not that thing that you do, that you document, and that you just file in the bottom drawer, like sometimes happens with those legal documents. It's more, it actually becomes a hanger, a driver for the SDLC and the PDLC, Privacy Development Lifecycle. Because you start upfront figuring out what can go wrong, that becomes input for your design, for the controls that you need to implement, for the stuff you should test for. And because that's the same structure, the same process for security and privacy, this brings both together and brings privacy back into engineering. Yeah, but that sounds kind of hard. We can't do it. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not a straightforward thing. Privacy is still an evolving domain, and it's quite complex. The more you dig into it, the more you will see that it has some, some layers of complexity. You start with a feature that you want to build, so you're going to analyze that, the technical details. But of course, that feature doesn't live in isolation. It's part of a bigger system, bigger ecosystem often, because you have all those third, third party services. But it goes beyond that, it goes beyond the technical stuff. You also need to take into account the business context. Because that same feature that you built, for instance, to analyze some health data in a hospital context to help patients, that has way different privacy implications than if you take that exact feature, analyzing health information, but have that being part of some weird application on social media platform. Exact same feature, different business context, completely different privacy implications. So that means that you also need to take into account the broader environment, understanding where it will be mainly deployed, what countries, what legislations, but more, more specifically, who will be your users and what will be their expectations. Think about the, the menstruation tracking example. You need to understand what they are dealing with what they are expecting from your feature, from, the, from your product, from your system. So there's a lot of layers you need to take into account. So yeah, it's, um, it sounds like a problem. So just as an intermezzo, who knows what this building is? Yes. Yeah. Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, exactly. And it is beautiful. It was designed 140 years ago, even more. People um, are, are raving about it since then. Lots of art historians keep saying, this is awesome, one of its kind, amazing. <laughs> After 140 years, that awesome design still isn't finished. And it might be okay for a church. It's probably not going to work for software. So that's why I am a big fan of reasonable privacy, reasonable security. Yes, we can have awesome ideas, but it needs to be reasonable. I talked to so many people saying that the privacy thing, it's important, we know, we looked into it. But then we saw how difficult it was, and we didn't know how to get started, and so we just decided to not do it at all. And that's a shame, because whatever you can do, it's already great, and you can extend on that, you can grow on that. So if you just take one thing away from this today, is that take that ice cream message, do I really need it? That's already a great first step. That means you're introducing privacy. And you can grow on that, and that reasonable will evolve over time. It's not the same for all organizations. You don't need to have a full-fledged, extensive, rigorous analysis for all contexts, for all situations you can tackle that in a reasonable way. Okay, fine, but still we're not privacy experts. Not yet, but also you don't, you don't have to be to make an impact. Caring about it, and we all care about it because we care about data, we care about individuals. That's the first step. And leveraging your security expertise, your approaches, that helps too because of that shared foundation. So, my call to action is use your security expertise, and when you're developing, threat model every story. Think about security, think about privacy, 
what are the implications? Should we fix something? There's a, a bunch of techniques there. Continuous threat modeling is one of those that actually help developers to threat model. When you're testing, verify those privacy protections that at design time might be described. Verify that they're actually in place. Threat model, too. Either reuse that threat model from an, an earlier phase or do your own threat model and find what the, the main issues will be because that, that gives you focus, that gives you scope. Bug bounties, yes, works for privacy, too. For instance, the, this is a sidetrack comment. Talk to me after if that if you think that, that there is something interesting there, those data subject access requests, for instance, organizations should give you information, but they need to be sure about your identity. There might be some, uh, some confidentiality issues there, too. So privacy, security coming together. Those privacy violations, share those also with organizations raise awareness, it's important for them from a legal perspective, but also from a reputation, from a, a user um, perspective, user value. So, use your security expertise. You care, you're an ally, so be a privacy champion. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Question here. So, <clears throat> so you were talking about um, securing the data, but you also have the data that you need to secure the data. So, <clears throat> I work in security operations, and we collect a lot of data. And you say minimize the amount of data that you need, but you actually don't know what you need right until it happens. So if somebody comes to me and says, well, I got this extra logging information, whatever, uh, do you want it? I always say, yes, give it to me, because it could contain the golden nugget for my next incident, right? So we collect more and more data, and that makes Microsoft very happy. But um, you can also use that data for other things, right? So there could be instances where an employee gets fired, and they want data from your set of data to get uh, yeah, information for that uh, firing. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Because we, we shift from uh, collecting the data that we need to uh, giving access to the data when you need it, right? So that's... Yeah, I, it, it's like you said, basically. I'm going to start with the consultancy answer. It depends. Um, <laughs> It, it's, it's, it's really that. It's not a black and white decision. I can say here, let's minimize as much as, as, as needed. The kind of academic perspective on privacy is, let's do no data at all. Uh, well, that's true. The less data there is, the, the better from a privacy perspective. But you still need data, because that's how you, you need your features or your, your, your uh, security operations to work. There's different... Um, there's, there's this, how do you say it, gradient uh, zone of, of solutions there. Instead of completely removing everything because you need stuff, yes, find out what will you definitely need. Maybe collect a bit more if that's within reason. But as you say, don't allow access to it unless there's this special security case, have additional access control measures there in place. Don't allow your marketing department or HR department to also use that, that logging information there. So have separate some data that you're storing. You can log things, but those may hopefully don't have the identities of the employees clearly there. So maybe you can log a lot of stuff, but have the actual identifying information in a, in a different database, and you can link them when there's actually issues. So, so there's different ways of approaching it. It's not a, this is fully compliant, or this is not, same for security. But you can do a lot of things to make it more privacy respecting and still make it secure. So there is a bit of a, a trade-off to be made there. But yeah, go for reasonable. There's no way to do it perfect. That's. Okay. 
Thank you, Ed. Great talk. As a consumer, I like everything you say, but <laughs> let's say I'm Facebook, I'm Tesla, I'm whoever, I'm deliberately capturing your data because I think I can sell it, I think I can mine it. Data is the new oil, all that stuff. How do we incentivize those businesses to do the right thing? That's a great question. If I knew, <laughs> yeah, I wish I knew. Um, the, the, the privacy data protection legislations out there help already, and having those fines pop up from time to time, they typically go, so media has this kind of a small one, but we see most of the, the DPA fines going to the metals and the Googles and the big ones of the world to, to make a statement and to show to the world, like, well, this stuff that they are doing, we're going to find them. And if you don't fix it, well, we're going to come after you too. <sighs> Is it actually working? I don't think so, not yet. So it's, it's, it's a combination of growing awareness. We see more users becoming aware there, but also users are lazy. So if you have usability versus privacy, it's, it's difficult having that incentive. But I, I, I really see that more people are valuing the, 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 the applications that take privacy into account. I hope we're going to evolve to a scenario where that makes enough impact. The combination of, of having those legislations and people asking for it. I, what I think works best is when you think about the way around. If you don't invest in privacy and then something blows up, it will blow up big because you also have the fines on top, the reputation loss. So it's, it's thinking about, OK, if we don't do it, we're going to save some money now. But well, we all know data breaches are it's not an if, it's a when kind of situation. So let's, let's already tackle it now, because the, the, the fallout will be way bigger if we didn't invest in, for instance, that minimization. More questions here? Maybe in the second room, we we'll also have a mic. If you have questions, I cannot see you, but I can <laughs> hear you. So, oh. Thank you very much, Kim. It was a really good presentation. Uh, Bex, a little bit down to what was asked earlier. Uh, how do you feel about the fact that the le different legislations around the world are drifting apart, I find, a bit, and there's a lack of a global harmonization because many of the companies we work for obviously we apply it globally and the fact that we have for example in the states already different regulations per state just trying to understand the all that information for us to then populate it correctly is already a big challenge like you mentioned we are not privacy pros yet we need to consume it and action it do you know of any initiatives of getting that more let's say harmonized or standardized I've, I've, I've listened into those conversations, um, like the policy people, the, the lawyers. It's not going to happen. <laughs> they don't agree. Also, there's different expectations uh, across the, the world for what, what privacy is. If you talk to US people, they're like, well, I don't care about my privacy. I, here's my social security number. Have fun. Um, China also has a different perspective. I mean, there's there's... It's really different, difficult to align all of that. There, there's, they are, there are um, attempts to at least visualize how it all maps together. The, the, if you want to be compliant, basically go with this, the strictest one, which is more or less GDPR. So, thank, thank you, Kim. Thank you.